Hi, and welcome back to Focal Point AFR Talk. Great to have you with us. I want to get to some Paul Ryan sound bites, so I'm going to take two more phone calls, and then I want to play some sound bites from Paul Ryan's speech on Wednesday night, which I thought was very compelling, very effective. Let's quickly go to De- Deborah in Katy, Texas. Deborah, you're on Focal Point with Brian Fisher. What's on your mind? Hi, Brian. Hi. Uh, th- thank you so much for being a voice of truth for our country. We you're appreciate welcome. So much. You're welcome. Thank you for saying so. I uh, wanted to uh, refer back to the woman that you talked to earlier about her concern about uh, what Buster Wilson had said regarding um, uh, abortion uh, and uh, to the man that was on his, his show. Um, I'm going to kind of qualify it, the, and that was that the man whose wife uh, that he was talking to uh, his wife was pregnant with a baby that was implanted in a fallopian tube. Uh-huh. And so Buster was, you know, um, basically encouraging the man and, and helped him to understand, you know, helped him to understand that God would forgive him uh, regarding, uh, you know, um, uh, going ahead and, and, and uh, ab- you know, aborting the baby, if that's what you want to call it. The baby would never survive in the fallopian tube. So if Yeah, you, it, it could, not, could not possibly come to term. You're right. Right, and and if you left the baby there, both the mother and the child would die. Yeah, so that's what's called a that's what's called a tubal pregnancy, and it is. and its reason it's called a tubal pregnancy is the 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 the, ch- the child is not implanted in the womb of the mother, so it has no chance to develop and grow and survive. All right, right. anything else you want to add, Deborah? Sir. Yeah, go ahead. I, I I if you haven't finished your thought, I want to give you time. Go ahead. Oh no, I'm finished with that thought. Okay, good. All right. Well, I appreciate the call. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I, you know, just Buster Wilson. I mean, you're not going to find a more pro-life guy than Buster Wilson anywhere on planet Earth. I can assure you of that. Let's go to Sandra Tipton uh, County, Tennessee. Last call of the day. Sandra, welcome to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. What's on your mind? Hello, Brian. I'm glad to speak with you. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to make a comment about Clint Eastwood speaking at the convention. Yeah. Uh, I know he um, maybe should have prepared those remarks a little better, but although some thought it was strange that he was speaking to an empty chair, there's something I've been seeing in newspapers for many years that I've always resented, and I'd like to draw that parallel for you. Gary Trudeau does the Doonesbury yes. comic strip, mm-hmm. and years ago it was taken out of comics and put on the editorials and columns page yeah, for good it, reason. Yeah. <laughs> um, he always represents President George W. Bush as an ancient war helmet over an asterisk. Hmm. And would <laughs> like an empty shell, an empty helmet, you know. Yeah. And uh, I always thought that was not very uh, flattering to the president, and he wasn't intended to be, not one little bit. Uh-huh. But, um, you know, I don't want to say, you know, tit for tat, well, one does it, the other should. Certainly not. But maybe Clint, <laughs> even at 82, uh, thought, oh, surely everybody will get this. Maybe he was doing something along the same lines as if, and it, this has been mentioned today already, empty chair, uh, not being, things are not being handled. Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of a, just kind of an empty chair, empty suit, maybe empty policies. All right, Sandra, listen, I appreciate that. Thank you very much for that. And speaking of that, Paul Ryan said some of the same things. Let's grab some Paul Ryan uh, clips. Let's grab clip 11. Let's start at the top, Rob. I'm going to not be able to play all of these, but let's let's grab clip 11. This is from Paul Ryan's speech where he accepted the vice presidential nomination on Wednesday night. Clip one. Right now, 23 million men and women are struggling to find work. 23 million people, unemployed or underemployed. Nearly one in six Americans is in poverty. Millions of young Americans have graduated from college during the Obama presidency, ready to use their gifts and get moving in life. Half of them can't find the work they studied for or any work at all. So here's the question. Without a change in leadership, why would the next four years be any different from the last four years? And thunderous applause to that. And speaking of the the kind of place that we're at, let's drop down to clip 17, uh, Rob, where he talks about college graduates. Uh, you know, he paints an interesting picture here, and this is one of the enduring word pictures from Paul Ryan's uh, speech. You know, we've talked about the fact that college graduates just cannot find work. They can't find jobs. The bulk of the unemployed people now, 
the bulk, the majority of the unemployed people in America have a college education, some college education or a college degree, and they cannot uh, find uh, work. So we have uh, clip 17 ready to go. Okay, let's give clip 17 a shot. College graduates should not have to live out their 20s in their childhood bedrooms, staring up at fading Obama posters and wondering when they can move out and get going with life. Everyone, everyone who feels stuck in the Obama economy is right to focus on the here and now. And I hope you understand this too. If you're feeling left out or passed by, you have not failed. Your leaders have failed you. None of us, none of us should have to settle for the best this administration offers, a dull, adventureless journey from one entitlement to the next, a government-planned life, a country where everything is free but us. That's a great line, a country where everything is free but us. Rob, let's just grab the next soundbite in sequence. This is clip number 18, the very next soundbite. And this is Paul Ryan echoing some of the themes you heard from Marco Rubio. You heard some of this from Mitt Romney. And again, when these political figures, when they talk about faith, it resonates. People are hungry for this. This is not something for the GOP elites to shy away from, to run from, to be embarrassed by, to get squeamish and squirrely about and, and wring their hands and, and wipe their brows and head for the fainting couch. The American people want robust leadership, not just economically, but also spiritually. Let's listen to Paul Ryan. Our faiths come together in the same moral creed. We believe that in every life there is goodness. For every person there is hope. Each one of us was made for a reason, bearing the image and likeness of the Lord of life. We have responsibilities, one to another. We do not each face the world alone. And the greatest of all responsibilities is that of the strong to protect the weak. The truest measure of any society is how it treats those who cannot defend or care for themselves. Babies in the womb, that's what he's talking about. Each of these moral ideas each of these moral ideas is essential to democratic government, to the rule of law, to life in a humane and decent society. They are the moral creed of our country, as powerful in our time as on the day of America's founding. They are self-evident and unchanging. And sometimes, even presidents need reminding that our rights come from nature and God and not from government. And I mean, the, the applause, we could have let the applause run for a solid 30 seconds there. Again, just resonating. And you notice what, what Paul Ryan is articulating here. Uh, and that's why he's sort of the intellectual leader right now of the conservative movement. He wants to bring America back to our founding principles. He's articulating these principles of the value of the sanctity of life, these great moral ideas. He's not shying away from dealing with these great moral ideas, just like Rick Santorum did on the campaign trail. He says they are the moral creed of our time, as powerful in our time as on the day of America's founding. Well, let's listen to the last soundbite, the next, uh, next one on the roster there, Rob, clip 19. Here is how, here's how Paul Ryan finished his acceptance speech. Let's listen. So here is our pledge. We will not duck the tough issues. We will lead. We will not spend the next four years blaming others. We will take responsibility. 
We will not try to replace our founding principles. We will reapply our founding principles. The work ahead will be hard. These times demand the best of all of us. All of us, but we can do this. We can do this. Together, we can do this. We can get this country working again. We can get this economy growing again. We can make the safety net safe again. We can do this. Whatever your political party, let's come together for the sake of our country. Join Mitt Romney and me. Let's give this effort everything we have. Let's see this thing all the way through. Let's get this done. Now, I'd say that is not a bad speech. Uh, and, and part of what makes that a great speech, and I think it was a great speech, is that this is obviously coming from Paul Ryan's heart. He's articulating a political philosophy that resonates. It's identical to the political philosophy that founded this country, on which this country was founded. And that's why the delegates at the convention that are ordinary conservatives, just like you and me, they just ate it up. They couldn't get enough of that. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bow low before God, bow, uh, stand tall before man, stand in the gap. Never forget, we are fighting a winnable war. Have a great weekend. See you back here on Monday. The views and opinions expressed in this